In this episode of our ongoing look at Earth's magnetic reversal, we'll build on our previous summaries. We've seen how the magnetic poles are speeding up on collision course offshore Indonesia. Earth's magnetic fields went from weakening 5% per century to 5% per decade. Numerous recent studies confirm these events can happen within a human lifetime, and the mission manager from ESA Swarm says the Earth's magnetic poles are getting ready to flip. We've looked at solar activity and cosmic rays, discussing how their increased bombardment of Earth can trigger increased seismic and volcanic activity. We've seen how the Sun's activity modulates El Nino and La Nina, the Pacific and North Atlantic oscillations, the intertropical convergence zones and monsoonal patterns, all set to deliver negative phases and dramatic shifts from the last few centuries as the Sun hits grand minimum over the coming few years to decades and Earth's magnetic field continues to weaken. But thus far, our weather look in the magnetic reversal has been a long-term one, a climate-forcing expectation based on the currently published literature and taking it a bit further with the grand solar minimum coming and Earth's magnetic reversal underway. However, the lithospheric effects we've seen are much shorter term. But to have their effects on the ground, the space energy must first navigate the atmosphere and the global electric circuit. The recognition of cosmic rays and solar activity as having a modulating effect on lightning and other short-term weather phenomena goes back well before those seismic, volcanic, and long-term weather connections to space. Over the last few decades, much driven by Dr. Brian Tinsley out of Texas, an incredible amount of information on space energy and lightning, cloud formation, atmospheric ionization, hail, nucleation, and more has been steadily coming out. Cosmic ray-induced particle showers are so well understood to have effects on short-term cloud properties that even the IPCC recognized the need to investigate these cosmic connections to terrestrial weather. Today, the effects on ice nucleation, cloud condensation, and lightning showers are well recognized, even if we're still trying to figure out the minutia of how it all works. So now, just like before, as Earth's magnetic field weakens and the Sun enters grand minimum this century, both of Earth's shields against cosmic rays are dwindling, and we should ask what effects there will be, and should we be looking beyond the recent Princeton bombshell about the cooling effects of clouds? The best summarization of the air-shower cosmic ray effects is electric. The cosmic ray particle cascade starts off as one super energetic proton breaking down into muons, electrons, neutrons, and photons as it collides and scatters its energy through the atmosphere. More lightning storms, more lightning strikes, stronger lightning strikes, more cloud cover, and higher variability of that cloud cover, easier freezing of supercooled water into more larger hail, and there is even considerable evidence growing in regard to wind speed correlation with solar wind parameters. All the things that make these correlations true have to first overcome the magnetic shield of our planet, and in terms of cosmic rays, the sun's magnetic shield as well. That means that the weather can only intensify as the electric cascade from space intensifies. Now, Let's take some time to go over some basic prepping notes. No way to do this comprehensively in this video or in one video alone, but we can get you started. I want to hit two points right now. How should you prepare? And are there some areas in the world that are going to be in worse trouble than others? Let's start with the basic prepping. So as to not overload all at once, let's get our heads around some of the basic things you need in any emergency, long or short. It's good to have food, water, and supplies, including for yourself, your family, and your pets. The other basic part of this is keeping your head out of the sand. I assure you that you won't be hearing major updates from CNN, reality TV, celebrity Twitter accounts, etc., so making sure you are paying attention to the right places is probably one of the best ways you can prepare. However, the Earth's magnetic reversal, combining with solar grand minimum, presents some challenges to the basic prepper. These events may not be short-term, in fact they are unlikely to be, especially when we are talking about the potential grid effects. At the National Space Weather Forum in Washington, D.C. last year, I sat listening to how unprepared we were, how our electrified way of survival can be taken away in a matter of hours. And since only a handful of groups have all the contracts for emergency aid pretty much everywhere, it is commonly believed that such a business model is based on things not getting too bad in too many places all at once, certainly not everywhere at the same time. So, 
what else should you consider? The first thing that comes to mind for this non-comprehensive list, please do recognize there is so much more, is the long-term need for that food and water, not to mention those medicines and pet supplies that might apply to your personal situation. Our government says we could be down months to years, so seeds and tools and books on how to live are useful in that type of life, maps on local areas, goods to barter, especially vice goods, clothes for extreme weather, etc., but also the mental side of things, local ways to survive the plants, trees, the insects, mushrooms, the terrain, the waterways, and what about your neighbors? Do you have a bug out plan? What about a bug in plan? If you can stay in your castle, it is always best. You're starting to get the picture of how comprehensive a mental exercise this can be in addition to the physical preparation. But let's now go to an overview of areas of the world that are likely to be under duress. I absolutely did move my family across the country. Now this is not a move everyone can or should make. My job is here online and can be done anywhere, my wife is our CEO and is capable of anything, and my kids are not yet in school, not much tying me back. I am not willing to bet against all the available data I can find, or the patterns of our planet that have persisted since long before humans started their first fire. If I could even find one clue that we were not on the verge of a reversal, I'd say so, but I can't, and I chose a place I find suitable against many future hardships. Let's take these one at a time. First thing that comes to mind is the coastline. Not only are there a lot of people, and people means chaos in an emergency, but the earthquakes and tsunamis, including those from subsurface ocean volcanoes triggering landslides, means that the coastal regions present a major concern, even if you're not at a major fault line. Do you know how to spot the pre-tsunami warning signals? Could be the difference between survival and something else. Even on the U.S. East Coast, where they don't have major earthquake risk, they have the Canary Islands across the Atlantic and the Puerto Rico Trench waiting for a landslide to send a massive wave at the coast. We mentioned the high population areas already, and this one is pretty simple. More chances for chaos, less resources in a disaster, crowded exodus from weather or tsunamis. One of the most basic location safety points is you wouldn't want to be in Times Square when everything bad begins to go down. Let's step down to the severe weather events. It's not like you'll see tornadoes in Death Valley or Mount Everest or even here in the high desert, but areas that see them could see more. The breadbasket is going to see hailstorms like they've never seen before. The wind, precipitation, ice, flash flooding, all intensifying. So picking your battleground is important for us here in New Mexico. There are no quakes or tsunamis, not really any tornadoes, and Less of the other severe risks as well, provided you are not living in an arroyo. We also have a low geomagnetic vulnerability profile. Mid-latitude is by far the safest in terms of space weather. Polar regions take the strongest induction, and that does indeed bleed down into the United States. The practical reality for us humans is that the risk is a combination of population density, or rather electric grid density, grid usage, along with your geomagnetic latitude, which is why you see increased potential even during calm days down the coastlines. However, one can't simply head south from Canada per se without looking back. Get too far south and you come under duress of the equatorial electrojet and the magnetospheric compression of solar eruptions reinforcing the downward precipitation of Earth's equatorial ion fountain and adding Van Allen particles to the precipitation as well. We do indeed see equatorial excitation and risk potential growing along the equator with the polar regions. And let's not forget the South Atlantic anomaly is there, the most prolific upsetter of satellite GPS in the space age. Now thinking back to high latitude risk one more time, the last note is one about cold. Since cold records doubled heat records last month in the U.S., since snow records continue falling, since Princeton described a cooler future than models predict from above, and Yale did so from below, and with our current interglacial overdue for a major drop in temperatures on this planet, one must caution against the warming-only propaganda in the news. Climate change absolutely goes both ways, and with the sun going to sleep as our shields falter, it's a recipe for deadly cold events if you are too far north or south. 
You've seen the primary website, magneticreversal.org, and it is frustrating that the next official update is still two years away. By the way, that is because the poles make large circles in their movement over short times and up to a full year, and only by tracing those circles over time can you ascertain the general movement of the poles. The last update came without a new percentage down of our field, but we're likely somewhere around 20% or maybe a bit more. And now, if you want to do some tracking over shorter time scales, we watch the effect on tropical storms, cyclones, and typhoons, one of the connections that led Ferris Wald to win the National Middle School Science Championship this year. If you want to see how well correlated these events actually are, we have tracked space energy effects on that most severe weather since that 2015 update over at earthchanges.org, and we'll keep tracking. Eyes open. No fear. Be safe, everyone.